Okay, well, we'll get right into it. I know we have limited time. Um, as uh, Liz uh, just mentioned, we are a high-grade uranium exploration and development company. Um, I'm the president and CEO. I started the company about five and a half years ago. Um, talk a little bit about the history of the company and, and, and what we're doing, but uh, really the genesis of, of Sky Harbor um, uh, post Fukushima uh, in a very difficult uranium market was uh, we, we went out there with a contrarian view, saw a deep value opportunity in this space, um, in the, in the specifically in uranium. And uh, we, we set out to go and uh, acquire projects and assets in, in what's the highest grade depository of uranium in the world, uh, in northern Saskatchewan. It's right in the middle of Canada. Uh, some of the richest, highest grade mines in the world. Uh, and, and more importantly for us, uh, some of the more notable uh, recent discoveries that have been made that have yielded uh, billions of dollars in, in shareholder value in the last five or six years. So we set out, um, we put a team together, which I'll talk about, and set out and started acquiring projects projects at attractive valuations. We're able to buy these properties, these assets at pennies on the dollar. Uh, and then what we've done since then, and, and this is really uh, where the, the true value creation comes for the shareholders and for the stakeholders, uh, is we've gone out and we've advanced these projects. And uh, there's a couple of ways in which we create shareholder value and, and really our main business. Uh, one is we're out there looking for new deposits. We're in the business of finding new uranium high-grade deposits in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, and then what we do is we look to advance these deposits, <coughs> these projects, um, de-risk them, and then ultimately have a larger mining company or a, a larger utility come in and develop or build the mine. Uh, so really our end game, our exit strategy, as is the case with most junior miners, is we're out there looking to ultimately sell the projects and or sell the companies uh, or the company. I was involved with a gold company previously that was acquired by a larger gold mining company called Bayfield Ventures. Uh, so that's where, where I cut my teeth. <clears throat> and then secondly, uh, we do what's called prospect generation. So we have built an inventory of properties in northern Saskatchewan, over 200,000 hectares scattered throughout this uh, Athabasca Basin. And what we do there is we look to bring in strategic partners. So we have a technical team that will advance the projects, that will package them up, and then we look to bring in strategic partners that we can farm these properties out to. So the discovery process, the, the, the main catalyst, if you will, and value driver for us, uh, we're focused on almost entirely at our main project. And then we complement that with what's called prospect generation. And a recent deal that we just consummated is with uh, France's largest nuclear and uranium mining company. I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, what was previously called Ariva, is now called Arano. They're buying one of our projects right now, earning in 70%, have to spend $8 million. Uh, it's a third of our current valuation, our market cap. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So a strategic partner of ours uh, here in Europe. <clears throat> so I don't know, I'll get right into it. Uh, investment highlights. So the, the, we like to use this acronym uh, to keep things simple. Um, people, timing, and projects, right? So the, the, the first core ingredient that we put together when we started this company was, was assembling the team, the management team, the technical team, strategic partners, and now also some long-term shareholders and, and really partners of ours, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Timing. Timing has to do with where we're at in the uranium market, and I think this is a key takeaway right now. Uh, this is a commodity that has been under siege for the better part of the last seven or eight years, and that's really what drew our interest into this initially, was going in there, uh, again, as contrarians, being able to acquire assets at pennies on the dollar, putting together what we consider to be a top tier portfolio of properties in the best uh, uranium mining jurisdiction in the world. And so we're poised to take advantage of this next move up in the uranium market. And as a junior company, we offer leverage to that. So you see the price of the commodity moving, we'll move up, we'll offer more torque as that price moves up. And then last but not least, projects. So the asset base, what we're doing, as I said, we have a dual prong strategy. We're actually the only company uh, still in existence in this sector uh, that offers that dual prong strategy. Uh, one being the new discovery uh, that we're making at our flagship project, uh, the deposit, we have a small deposit there, uh, and we're finding more mineralization. And then secondly, prospect generation. 
So we'll start with the first uh, of the people, timing, and projects, and that's the people. So I started the company five and a half, six years ago. Just a quick background on me. I'm an entrepreneur. I've worked in this uh, industry now for about 10 years. As I mentioned previously, I was at a gold company called Bayfield Ventures. Uh, we had success there, high-grade gold discovery uh, back in 2010, ultimately acquired by a larger gold mining company in 2014, and that's when I started uh, started Sky Harbor. My chairman, Jim Pettit, uh, he ran Bayfield Ventures. Him and I worked together in Vancouver. We partnered up with uh, our, my, who's now my head geologist, a gentleman out of Saskatoon, uh, so close to where the projects are, Rick Kazmersky. Um, Rick's a 40-year veteran exploration geologist. He was actually the exploration manager at the world's largest publicly traded uranium company, Cameco uh, Corp. He did that for about 12 years. He then left and he started, uh, built his own uranium company, JNR. He took it from a $5 million market cap to over $400 million in 2006 and 2007 and he ultimately sold it uh, to another company that's actually here, Denison Mines. And that brings me to uh, another director, uh, Dave Cates, who's here. Uh, Dave is the president and CEO of Denison Mines. Uh, Denison is a strategic partner of ours. They're our largest shareholder. Uh, they own just under 10% of the company. Uh, Dave and uh, the Denison team got involved about three years ago. We did a deal with them uh, whereby they became the largest shareholder and we acquired a project from them. So a very important part of our story uh, and a strategic partner. Uh, Paul Matizic, who's a strategic advisor, large shareholder of the company. Paul is very well known in the mining industry. He's built and sold now five companies. Uh, his biggest win was a uranium company in the mid-2000s. He took it from a $10 million valuation when he started it in 2004, ultimately selling it uh, to Uranium One for just under $2 billion. And then last but not least, head field geologist Christine McKechnie. So Christine uh, has uh, worked in this industry for about a decade. She has focused expertise on uh, Athabasca Basin uranium deposits. Uh, she runs a very tight ship, very good operator. Uh, and she actually she wrote her thesis on one of the deposits that we have in our portfolio. Just quickly, capital structure. Um, so you'll see here 64 million shares out. Uh, it's small cap at about 22 $23 million Canadian. Uh, as I talked about before, uh, we like to highlight here some of our larger and strategic shareholders. First and foremost, management and insiders. We own a large position in the company, about 20%. Dennis and Mines, as I mentioned earlier. KCR fund managed by uh, Marin Katuza in Vancouver. They've been a cornerstone investor really since day one. And then more recently, we've seen a little bit more institutional and even some family office interest uh, coming in. Uh, most of the recent financings have been institutional. OTP fund management out of Budapest, uh, it's the largest bank in Hungary. They're one of the larger shareholders. Extract Capital and Sachem Cove are two funds, resource funds out of New York uh, that have come in, in, in more recently. And then uh, you'll see Jeff Phillips, Global Market Development, runs a family office out of San Diego, has become one of the largest shareholders as well. So um, getting now on to the second part of that acronym, timing. Um, so timing with the uranium market, where are we at in the cycle? And I'm happy to discuss this with anyone afterwards. I could, I could go on for hours on this. Uh, but uh, just getting back from a you know, very top-down, uh, high level here, uh, people tend to forget you know, really what uranium is used for, um, why it's important. Uh, so uranium is the fuel for nuclear reactors. Nuclear uh, accounts for 11% of global electricity generation. Uh, you have places like, for example, France, that's over 75%. Here in the UK, 21%. Uh, North America, about one in five homes. Uh, so it's a very, very important part of the electrical grid globally. Uh, one of the biggest things uh, that we like to highlight here um, is that uh, in addition to it being emission free, it's baseload power. It's 24 seven. So a lot of people think of nuclear as competing against renewables, wind, solar, hydro. It really doesn't have to be. It can be that baseload source of electricity to complement other renewable sources. Uh, it can provide that electricity when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. And you'll see here, unmatched electricity generation in megawatt per square kilometer. Uh, that's also a very important part of this, is that you have uh, over 90% capacity factor. Uh, it's a very, very effective source of clean electricity. 
Now we talk about the market, and again, this is really what drew us into it, is looking at the fundamentals, looking at what was happening in the space. So we all know electricity growth uh, is rapid right now, electrification globally, whether it's the advent of electric vehicles uh, or just uh, emerging economies coming into their own, uh, we need more electricity. And most importantly, we need clean electricity. If we're truly going to combat climate change, nuclear has to play an important part in that. You'll see here 448 current operable reactors, 57 under construction, and hundreds more that are planned and proposed. The demand, 194 million pounds of uranium. Uh, when you look at what's happened recently on the supply side, this is where it's gotten quite interesting. Supply has been cut from 163 million pounds in 2016 to just over 130 million pounds in 2018. So you've finally started to see the supply side responding to this low price environment. Now when we look at how most uranium is bought uh, and traded in the market, most of it historically has been traded or bought by nuclear utilities through long-term contracts. And this is an important part of what's, I think, going to be happening here in the next few years. As these contracts, these long-term contracts roll off, expire, utility companies are going to have to come back to the market, renegotiate these, con these long-term contracts to make sure they have long-term secure supply. If you look at previous cycles with this commodity, Almost every single time, the main driver of a price increase in, in uranium had to do with a new contracting cycle. So you can see here the level of uncontracted or uncovered contracts here. You see it expanding quite rapidly. By 2025, uh, you have 50%, 65 almost two-thirds of the market uncovered by 2030. So here are some of the, uh, the, the players uh, on the demand side. China and India really are the growth centers, right? Here in the Western world, you know, we, we see a lot in the headlines the decline of this industry, but really it's a growth industry in parts of the world uh, like China, like India. Uh, you'll see here China in particular, 45 reactors uh, operating, 13 under construction. They've just announced uh, they're going to be breaking ground on four new uh, generation three bigger reactors here this summer. Uh, I want to just point your attention here. They've also been making strategic investments in Canadian uranium mining companies. Li Kai Shing is the largest shareholder of a company called NextGen Energy. CGN, uh, one of the largest nuclear utilities in, uh, in China, uh, invested $82 million in another company called Fission. Now, those two companies, NextGen and Fission, are comps for us. That's exactly what we're trying to emulate at Sky Harbor. They made large, high-grade discoveries in the Athabasca Basin, uh, both of which were started off as $20, $30 million uh, companies. Next NextGen is now a billion dollar company and Fission's around $300, $350 million. And again, they've had strategic investments from the Chinese. India, um, India, you'll see there 22 reactors operating, seven under construction. Going over to Japan, Japan's obviously been the, the elephant in the room. Well, they've now restarted nine of their reactors. The Abe administration's pro-nuclear. They're looking to restart an additional 21 reactors. And what's really captured a lot of the headlines recently is in the U.S. For those of you familiar with this space, you've probably heard of this Section 232 investigation, the U.S. looking at uh, slapping on a 25% quota domestically. Now, this is where it could get interesting for Canada. The U.S. does not have the production capacity for 25%. It would take them six to seven years and about a doubling of the uranium price to get there. So where is the U.S. going to go then? Because they still are the largest consumer of uranium globally. Where are they going to go to get stable, secure supply of uranium? And historically, it's been in Canada in the Athabasca Basin. So this just quickly shows uh, the supply cuts recently. As I said, there has been a massive supply side response to this low price environment. You'll see here over the last few years, there's been about 30% of primary mine supply cut or sequestered. Uh, you're seeing mine, mine simply running out of ore. They're coming to the end of their lives. And what's even more interesting, and this is applicable to here in London, there's been new funds that have been set up that are trying to take advantage of what they deem to be a structural mispricing in this commodity. So one fund here based in London, listed in London, called Yellow Cake PLC, raised $200 million of just over a year, or just under a year ago. They've now bought 8.4 million pounds of uranium that they're sitting on, they're storing it in Canada, they're looking for a price increase. So uh, we'll get on to the last part, and that's the projects. Uh, specifically, what are we doing at Sky Harbor to take advantage of what we think will be one of uh, 
one of the biggest bull markets in, in any commodity coming up. We're, we're well poised to take advantage of that. We'll start with where we're at. Athabasca Basin is, as I said, the highest grade depository of uranium in the world. For those of you familiar with other metals uh, and other mining, you'll see here 1% U308 uh, is about $770 per ton rock. It's equivalent to about 20 grams of gold. For those of you who are familiar with copper, 14% copper, very, very high grade. These are actually some of the highest grade mineral deposits uh, and, and value per ton deposits that you can find out there. Gold, silver, copper, diamonds, you name it. High grade Athabasca Basin deposits are some of the most valuable deposits that we can find. Look at these charts here, uh, draw your attention. So you're probably familiar with these companies or if you, if you know the space, as I mentioned, Next Gen Energy and Fission Uranium. These are two companies in the last five years that have gone from 20, $30 million valuation, similar to where Sky Harbor is. Uh, and you'll see here by their charts, uh, Next Gen in particular uh, has gone, moved up to about a billion dollar valuation. Now, how have they done this? They've done this on the back of high grade discoveries in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the last five or six years, and again, one of the things that we're looking to uh, take advantage of is the technology and the methodology used to actually find these deposits has changed, right? So we now have at our disposal new geophysical techniques, new ways of drilling, new analysis on the geology that allows us to hone in using less money, uh, lower, less ca capital going into the projects to make these discoveries. And in particular, Fission and NextGen have found what are called basement hosted deposits. So historically, and I won't get into too much of the geology, but historically, the deposits in the basin were found in one type of rock. It's called the Athabasca sandstone. They did not look any deeper into what's called the basement rock. And that's where all the fluids, all the uranium came up from. So they, they simply were not looking where, where the actual source of the mineralization was coming up. Re, more recently, they've started, we've started looking a little bit deeper into this basement rock, and that's what's yielded these discoveries. And so you have this paradigm shift in the exploration, in the way we actually go about finding these deposits. And again, that's one of the things here at Sky Harbor uh, that, we're, that we're looking to do. So getting into the project portfolio, um, six projects that we've acquired, 200,000 hectares of property. Just to give you guys an idea of valuation, we've acquired these six properties scattered throughout the Athabasca Basin for about $4 million Canadian. They've had over $80 million in historical exploration invested into them. And at one point, two of these properties, our flagship Moore Project and Falcon Point, were in a company that was valued at over $300 million. So it shows you the kind of re-rating potential as we move through these commodity and uranium cycles. So getting into our flagship project, I'll quickly skip ahead here. So the Moore Lake project we acquired three years ago, we own 100% of it. Uh, it's located near uh, infrastructure. It's on the eastern side of uh, the Athabasca Basin. That's, there's uh, two operating mills there. That's where the existing mining infrastructure is. There's a road that just runs up adjacent uh, to the property. We acquired this project and over the last few years, what we've been doing uh, is going back into a small high grade deposit that was found about 20 years ago and we've been going in there with a new look at the exploration. As I said, we've used some new techniques, uh, some new ways of uh, refining the targets and that's yielded new discoveries. So right away, we went and started drilling this in early 2017. Uh, we hit some high grade mineralization um, in a new, in new area over here to the east uh, of the deposit. Uh, we went in, we found that uh, by using a, a new, basically, geochemical analysis. Um, more recently, what we've done, uh, just in the last year, is we flew drone surveys. Uh, these new uh, drone surveys allow us to get closer to the ground. They're deeper penetrating, so we get a better idea, better signature of what's below the ground. So this was uh, something that they were not able to do even five or six years ago, and it's given us a whole new look at the target. So with the current drilling that we're doing right now, we're actually just wrapping up uh, a winter drill program right now. We've been testing some of these new targets and already we're seeing in the core higher grade mineralization. Uh, last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, and this is I think a big talking point for how we're going to be making more uh, discoveries going forward, how we're going to be value adding this project. Uh, we are looking in the basement rock. As I mentioned, historically, a lot of the exploration, a lot of the drilling, including on this project, $40 million that's been invested in exploration historically. A lot of that was one dimensional. It was just looking for high grade in the sandstone. They did not look any deeper into the basement rock where the feeder zones are. We've just 
just started to do that here. And you'll see here some of the more recent drill results that we've issued, 1.3% uh, uranium, some cobalt and nickel as well. So that's an exciting part going forward for us with upcoming drill programs, news flow and catalyst for the company is testing these new targets. Just quickly, uh, the second part uh, and the other assets that we have, uh, second part of the business, as I said, prospect generation. And I won't get too into the weeds in this, but essentially what we do is we build up an inventory of properties, which we've done, five other projects that we have scattered throughout the Athabasca Basin. We, we package them up. We have the technical expertise to advance them to a point where we can package them up to a strategic to come in. So two deals that we've recently consummated, one with France's largest uranium mining and nuclear outfit, state-run company Arriva, now called Arano. As I mentioned earlier, it's an $8 million deal whereby they have to spend $7.3 million in exploration expenditure, $700,000 in cash payments uh, over a six-year period. They have a $2.2 million budget this year uh, that they're just, uh, they're just finishing up a winter drill program on. And then we did another deal with a company called Azincourt, similar deal whereby they can earn in 70% in the project. They have to spend four million over a three year period. Again, this all provides news flow for us. Uh, it, it provides another iron in the fire on top of what we're doing at our flagship project. Uh, and we also get to utilize the technical geological expertise of much larger strategic partners like Arano. And just to wrap up here, quickly go over, so recent milestones and catalysts. Uh, so for us, again, we're very much focused on the discovery process at our flagship project at Moore. As I said, we're using some new techniques, new, in new innovative techniques and methodologies to go in and find more high grade uranium. Uh, secondly, prospect generation, our partner companies, Arano and Azincourt, both of which are exploring and funding exploration at our other projects. Look for more of these joint venture partnerships, these option deals. Uh, we are talking right now with a few other groups. And then last but not least, uranium market recovery. Uh, this is, I think, a big talking point for us right now, given where we're at in the cycle. The current cost of uh, production globally is about 40 to $45 a pound. Uranium right now is trading at 26, so it's got a long way to go to get back up to that average global cost of production. I'm just here, ESG, uh, happy to talk more about this. Uh, we are an exploration company, so relatively low environmental impact and footprint. Social, this is something we do take pride in. Uh, we employ a lot of nor Northerners, First Nations uh, in these Northern communities uh, at, our, at our drill rig, at our, our camps. Uh, so you'll see there, we're big, actually big source of the economic uh, growth in these Northern communities comes from the mining companies. There's a long history of, of mining in, for, in the First Nations in Northern Saskatchewan in particular. And then just to wrap up again, I like to go back to the people timing and projects, right? So we have a, a great team that we've assembled uh, with focused expertise in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, Rick and his team have found multiple discoveries uh, in, in throughout the years. Uh, timing with the uranium market, again, as a junior company, we're going to have that leverage, that torque to a rising uranium price. And then the project base, how we create shareholder value through new discoveries, through resource delineation, and through strategic partnerships with Denison, with Arano, with Azincourt. So I think that uh, that covers everything. I know I'm out of time here, so uh, if there's any quick questions, uh, happy to answer them.